fun little presentation for you guys. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat and then we will address them at the end. Uh, maybe some of the questions will be answered as we go through, but yeah, if you think of anything, just throw them on in there so you don't forget about it later. But this is kind of an ongoing presentation that uh, follows the journey at the Ford factory where they were doing the renovation. So once we went there and we did our scan to CAD, now what do we do with that? We went in, we scanned the whole thing, we got all that geometry data, we digitized it, we got surface file data. Now what? We have to be able to do something useful with this instead of just, you know, we have a cool snapshot in history now. Uh, what we want to do is use this data to help in the restoration and preservation of the uh, Ford station. So with that, there's a couple different approaches you can take to historical preservation. So it's really broken down into four different categories that's laid out by the uh, Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historic properties. And those four categories, it starts with preservation, and that's basically where you do nothing, right? You kind of freeze it in time, you stop decay and rot and keep it from getting worse, but you don't do any improvements and you just preserve it in its current state as like a physical snapshot in time. The next step up you can go from there is rehabilitation, where you do some improvements on the property to make it habitable. Uh, if you're going to be using it for something, if you're going to be using it for business work, do tours, whatever, but you do very minimal uh, improvements on the property and are fixing things up. It's mainly you, you upgrade it to a point where it's safe to be in instead of just locking it in time. And then that's about it. Then the next step up from there is restoration. Now this is the one that most people take when they're looking at fixing up a historical building where you want to have it accurately depict, you know, what it was like when it was originally built. So in the case of the Ford station, this is from you know, 1913, and they're going to want to renovate it and restore it up to the point where it looks like it was brand new 1913 kind of uh, feel and character to it and everything. And then the next level up is a little bit different, and that's reconstruction. And that's basically if you don't have any surviving structure and you want to build, have that structure again, that's a full reconstruction. So if something had burned down to the ground, completely collapsed from not being preserved at all then you can reconstruct it to have it resemble what it was previously. So with that, we can see what we can do with our data. So we have our scan of the architecture and there's lots of unique elements all over the place that can't be easily replicated. These were all you know, handmade back in the day. There was not CAD files for them. There might be drawings. Most of those are probably lost. And from there, even the, you're not gonna have any detailed drawings of things like these top pieces in the corners that are just hand plastered, you know, filigrees and whatnot that they're not gonna draw out. They're just gonna say, hey, artistic license over here, have fun, okay. So if we want to ensure historical accuracy and detail, this is a great first step where we got to scan it. Now we have that digital 3D snapshot in time and we have a full digital archive of this. So anyone who wants to use it for something in the future can go back and review this data, see what's changed, see what's not, uh, things like that. But we can use the scan data to actually replicate what might be missing. So because there's lots of repeated pieces of architecture going on here, so like this specific ceiling panel here, it's about 80 inches by 80 inches, and there would be a whole bunch of them up on the ceiling. So we're talking, you know, dozens in there. And if we want to, maybe some pieces are missing out of some of the the other versions and others have those pieces so we can scan the ones that have the existing data and use that to replicate to actually make copies of it that are very extremely faithful to the originals to put up for where we're missing data so let's take a closer look at the scan data we got so of that big 80 inch by 80 inch section we can we're going to isolate down just a small eight inch by eight inch a uh, piece with a lot of detail on it to see how, how we can recreate that. So if we take the highest quality scan data we can get out of that and see what it looks like, the problem with it is it's going to have show all the historical wear and tear and imperfections and cracks and giant pieces of peeling plaster, globs of paint that were put over it over, you know, the over past hundred years and, you know, just decay that's been happening to it. 
And that's not really great for what we want to do. So if we were to use this data specifically to start replicating what our, we want from it, all the replicated pieces are going to have these issues with it. It's going to show the chunks of plaster and paint that we're chipping off. And, and that's not really what we want. We want to bring it more to a recreation, re reconstruction side where we want to have it look like it was brand new in 1913. So there's a couple of things we can do to start cleaning up this scan data. So we don't have all of these individual little issues that were existed on that one part. So one thing we can do is bring it in at a slightly lower resolution that already have a nice smoothing effect on it. As you can see here, it's dramatically less featured in detail. We don't see the little flecks of paint coming off anymore and the thick plaster coatings that were put on it, but we still have a bunch of things that we can clean up. And there's a big crack kind of going through the bottom right here, kind of splitting right through the half all the way through it. So that's something that we'll want to clean up. So that way, when we use this to recreate the parts, we don't have every single part has a crack in the exact same spot on it. Now, using the software that comes with the scanners, the that you can get with the scanners, the VX model software for reverse engineering, it's very easy to go along and try and clean up your part, remove cracks, Defeature chunks of paint and flex and missing areas. So just by pretty much highlighting that crack in the software and saying, hey, remove this, it just deletes it out, patches it back over, and we end up with a very smooth area. And we can also go through and select other big chunks of data that we don't want replicated across everything. Say maybe that bottom left corner, we got some big chunks or buildup of old plaster. We can smooth those out, we can defeature those, and we can do just a bunch of general cleanup. But even here, still not what we want, we're looking for for you know, recreation, rebuilding the station back up. So we can refurbish it even further, and we can get, you know, do some more aggressive refurbishing, more aggressive smoothing, defeaturing, deleting out features we don't want, maybe adding definition to better areas. Uh, so like on the berries in the center there, we want to make deepen those grooves a little bit because they've been filled in by being repainted and replastered over whitewashed. So we do something like that. And again, you, this is all using the VX model software. It's very easy to clean up your digital files to get it back. Very close representation of our 1913 condition and what it would have looked like exactly when they first made it. So now with all the blemishes cleaned up and we have our nice cleaned up pretty looking 3D file, we need to now do something to recreate it in the real world. Now there's a bunch of different ways we can use 3D printing to lean on that to make something really cool. So we're going to look at three different technologies specifically in here for how we could replicate this part. So we're going to look at Polyjet, FDM, fused deposition modeling and stereolithography technologies just as a uh, starting point to see how these work, what the advantages and drawbacks on each technology might be, and which one we want to proceed with. So with that, there's a couple of things we we'll want to consider is the surface finish that we're going to get on the part at straight off the printer and how much additional work might need to go into cleaning up the surface, smoothing it out. Because uh, anything we have on our master part that we say make a cast from it or something is going to transfer directly over to our finished part. So we want to make sure we're not bringing over layer lines and things like that. So with the post processing needs, you know, how much sanding are we going to need to do, bondoing, painting, surface sealing, things like that, to, depending where we want to go with it. And also what materials those different technologies uh, get made with. So, if we're going to one of the routes we can go is we can print out the master mold and then the master copy and then make a silicone mold of it. Some materials actually can inhibit, inhibit silicone curing. And that could be an issue because if we find a good technology, it has everything we need and we print our part out of that, but the material is doesn't play well with silicone, we can't actually use that to make our mold very well. So a couple things to consider. Uh, there's other stuff depending on how you you want to look at that, but these are the criteria we're going to be looking at for this. So if we jump right into looking at what happens on a, if we use FDM to 3D print this part. So it makes uh, for pretty fast technology, pretty cheap, makes pretty strong parts. 
but it's going to have a little bit of surface finish issues. So depending how you orient the part in an FDM machine, so this is the one that works very similar to a hot glue gun, right? So you have a hot glue gun and it's just lying down a little bead of material that cools off and this is a uh, thermoform material. So it melts it and then cools off and comes rigid again. And you lay it layer by layer of that. Depending how you orient it, you can orient parts to minimize the layer lines you've seen. So you can see on this part, because I just reorient it more vertically in the chamber, you know, we can get some pretty nice smooth lines out of it. But still might be something that we're going to want to sand down because any little grooves could transfer over. And we'll be able to see that in all the different parts. But because this part has so many different features and curves and geometries all over the place, there's no one orientation we can pick that's going to make it perfect. And we're always going to end up with somewhere kind of like this up on the berries that you can see dramatically more prominent layer lines and stepping. And that's going to be something that's going to require a lot more smoothing and detail work to be able to smooth out so we don't see that within our final product. So because of that, we might rule it out as a, uh, an option depending on how much work or free time you have to do all this additional smoothing out without altering the geometry too much. And also FDM is not great for little tiny fine details depending on different types of architecture you might or things you might be trying to fix up. If they have even finer details than these parts, uh, FDM could be lacking there a little bit too. So if we look at another technology for stereolithography, we can end up with a part like this. So stereolography is a technology that's been around for a long time, and this is basically a fat curing photopolymer. So you have a giant, basically vat of a liquid photopolymer, and you have a laser that draws on the surface of that and a UV light that actually causes the where it hit the where it hits the polymer, causes it to cure into a rigid uh, curl plastic, pretty much. So you can make some really lightweight parts with this. They're really good at hollowing out parts with stereolithography. Uh, you can do really high feature detail and good surface details. Uh, one of the drawbacks for stereolithography is it does use breakaway supports exclusively for situations where you might need support if your overhangs become too much. And then when you break those away, you're going to be leaving little nubs that you have to clean up. But it also makes very sharp, crisp lines. So you can see how this part was oriented. We start seeing a little bit of the topology, like a topographic map being formed on the surface. Uh, it's much finer than most FDM machines can do. So it's gonna be less noticeable in that respect, not as thick, but they do turn out to be very sharp and crisp layer lines. So even though that they're much finer resolution on our Z-axis and stereolography, you still end up with situations where when you start getting the stair stepping, because it's such crisp edges, it really, it makes it really prominent on those areas. So again, we would have to smooth this out somehow to, you know, do a bunch of post-process work before we want to move to the step of actually making a mold from it. But it's, uh, it makes for, you know, a, a pretty good option because it's much higher resolution, but still has a bunch of issues that we can see we would have to deal with. And depending on what size part you want to make, some of the larger stereolithography systems can get fairly pricey. And if we were to look at our third option, polyjet printers, we can actually do two different things with the polyjet printers for uh, ways to approach this. We can either do like the last two where we print the rigid master to be able to try and cast a mold from, or we can straight directly print a rubber mold that we could cast right into. Now that could save you a whole step of the process and less things to worry about, less things to go wrong. So let's take a look at doing that rubber mold first. It's a pretty interesting one. So this is kind of a picture of that rubber mold. So top down view, it's the inverse, right? It's the inverse of the actual uh, part where we brought it in and we have to use some CAD software to bring it back. But with the Polyjet 3D printers, we can actually print a rubber material. So specifically, we print this with the Agilis material. So this is a short 30 rubber. So it's a pretty soft, flexible stuff. So we could be able to cast a plaster mold right into here and then peel it out. And this would be great if we have something where we're not doing a 
super large production of like today we only need 20 parts out of it we only need 50 parts out of it you know we can straight print the mold do our casts into that peel them out and then move on we'll be good to go without having to add these other steps in and then again we have our full digital archive so if we ever need to print this mold again we could just print it again we don't have to keep it in storage on a shelf somewhere for years just in case we have to pull it back out it's one of those big advantages of having a digital archive so as far as making that rubber mold if they see a little side detail here what we do is we take that scan data of our part bring it into solidworks and then we just you know built up a part around it did a subtraction to subtract out that surface data we captured with the scanners and then we're able to then make a mold out of it we even hollowed out the back so that way we weren't printing this big solid chunk of material so it makes the part cheaper makes it print faster and it actually makes the part more flexible because you know having a thinner rubber band versus a thicker rubber band is much easier to bend around so it makes it more pliable when we we're able to thin out the back and side walls and stuff. So from there, we took our 3D printed rubber mold, mixed up some plaster into it, let it cure, we're able to peel it out and then have a plaster replica directly from a 3D printed rubber mold that would be fully reusable and we could do multiple casts into it. So that's an interesting method to look at with being able to directly 3D print rubber molds. But if we, this is something that maybe we wanted to use silicone for, if we need something maybe it was softer uh, than the silicone, than, than the short 30, then we could look at still doing the master pattern, the cast foam. So we take the uh, print rigid polyjet part. So polyjet technology is good at doing very high detail, high surface finish. A lot of these parts look like injection molded rubber part or plastic parts like off the printer once you clean off the material. So that first picture kind of showed the support material on the part is just directly on the printer still. Then as we take it off to clean it up, it's just cold pressure washer, spray off all that support material, and you have five minutes, you have your completely finished, ready to use part. And from here, we can make our silicone master pattern off it. And we can see the details on here. There aren't, you can't really see any layer lines. We don't really see uh, stepping. And this is printed just laying flat. And the layers that it does aren't as rock hard sharp as the stereolography, so things look smoother and nicer. And we don't really have to do any post processing on this at all, just off the printer, clean off the support, and we're good to go. So now we can go ahead and cast it in silicone. So, really quick, silicone is pretty easy to use, two part mixture, uh, depending on how deep the overhangs are on your parts, will determine to what shore strength you want to get for your silicone. So for instance, the Agilus 30 mold we did was Shore 30. Uh, for this case, I used a Mold Star Shore 15 silicone, which is even softer, easier to peel off. And basically, if you have really deep overhangs, you have to really flex your mold to get off, you want to go for a softer silicone mold. Oops. And then you want to pick between, you know, there's platinum silicone, tin silicone, they both react similarly for different for the materials as far as if it's gonna inhibit its curing. But one of the big differences is that platinum silicone tends to not need a vacuum chamber to suck out all the bubbles on it when it's curing. And that makes life a lot easier. So I went with silk platinum for this one so we didn't have to worry about vacuum chambers. So all I had to do was mix up my batch of silicone, make a little form around the Polyjet 3D printed rigid part pour all the silicone in, let it cure, and then just peel it right out. And then if there were any issues on the silicone mold, if you mixed any little patches, you could go through and try and clean it up. Uh, this turned out to be great, didn't need any fixing of issues. And then from there, we have our fully ready to use cast. And this is kind of the exact same as that earlier rubber printed part. Now we got to that step with our silicone part after being cast off the master mold. So then we just cast our plaster directly into our silicone part, let it cure, peel the mold off, and it peels off extremely easily. I mean, you know, short 15, very flexible. And then we're able to get our plaster recreation. So 
what I was able to do from here is I grabbed another scanner and actually scanned in that plaster cast part we had to see how accurate it was to the original part because we want to have this be as faithful as we can when we're doing historical preservation recreation here and the accuracy ended up being oh see it says 98.7 percent of the part is within 0 0.01 inch accuracy so this is an extremely faithful recreation of the part and to give you an idea of kind of the scope of this project for doing the entire train station rehabilitation so here's the part that we scanned and the part that we actually worked on was one of those little squares on the sides here so we digitized it i'm going to go ahead and zoom into that one part we were working on so this is about eight inch by eight inch part and we zoom out we can see how where this thing fits in the entire overall feature and so this makes one 80 inch by 80 inch panel about. And then from here, we, each of those panels is going to go up on the ceiling of the station. And there's going to be a whole variety of those panels going across like this. So we're going to need to make lots of casts of these parts. It's not just we're casting one part, two parts. Okay, we're going to need probably 100 or more to be able to probably do that. And that's just for that one square. And depending if you want to recreate the entire 80 inch by 80 inch panel, then that's going to take a lot of work too. So I have some estimates for the cost of doing these different parts with different methods. So if we look at traditional plaster casting, if we went to a company and we said, we want to cast this part out of plaster and we need, you know, there's no CAD data. We don't have anything like we need you guys to make it, make us a plaster part. And it's just for that eight inch by eight inch part. And it was about $2,500 for them to make a plaster part like that. It's going to take them a while and they're going to have no guarantee on accuracy. You're going to send them pictures of it and say, hey, here's what it looks like. All right, cool. It's got four leaves. It's got some berries in the middle. Here's the dimensions. And then they'll make one up by today's standards, today's artists. And it's, you know, it's definitely a craft and there's no guarantee on accuracy. It'll guarantee it'll look similar, but it's not going to be any kind of accuracy on it. So then some other, the application we look at. So if we printed the rubber pulley jet part, that would take $700 of material with it hollowed out. And then we clean off the support material and we're ready to cast our plaster into it. If we did the rigid pulley jet part, that was about $300 of material. And it would take about three days total because once we printed it, cleaned off the support material, and then we had to cast our silicone mold around it and then we got to the point where we're ready to start casting our plaster so that took a little bit longer to do that silicone step and then we have our stereolography part that took uh two hundred dollars roughly in material and then we have would also need to smooth the part out properly make sure we don't over aggressively smooth it start ruining accuracy or defeaturing things and then we do our silicone cast but with all these we can get our 0 0.25 millimeter accuracy or 0 0.01 inch accuracy. And this is just for doing that eight inch square section here. So if we were to scale this up for the entire project, and you know, let's say you don't have any scanners or 3D printers with you. So if we were to favor the polyjet like rigid one, because that'd be really easy on that rigid master pattern to multiple casts, multiple silicone casts of it so we can have multiple uh, forms curing at the same time. Traditionally, so one square was about $2,500. If we scale that up to the 75 inch by 75 inch section, so that's almost 100 times bigger. Then, you know, that scales up, throw in some discount, goes $200,000. And then probably just scan it. If we're just doing that one square, it doesn't really make sense to buy a scanner and buy a printer because now we're $65,000 in if we use the GoScan Spark and the Object 30 Prime to 3D print the parts. You know, $65,000 for one 8 inch by 8 inch square, not a great deal. But if we scale that up to the an entire 75 inch by 75 inch panel, now we start seeing the ROI on the project versus having to pay skilled expert craftsmen to recreate something from the past that has existed with no guarantee of the accuracy. And one of the really big benefits of this is that we also will now own the equipment for any other projects we want to do. So just for these sections of panels going through the entire Ford 
building to do 20 different ceiling sections you know you can see the roi ends up paying for itself really quickly and now they can use it on those other features that they were scanning there the metal architecture just digital archiving other projects they will have access to all this equipment and ready to go you see the uh the price jumps from the 65,000 to the 100,000 because factoring in how much material it would take to because we're not buying any more equipment but we are using material to print all those sections the for on the polyjet machine and so just being conservative let's say we used you know thirty five thousand dollars of material to print all those parts out to make a giant 75 inch by 75 inch panel that we could then make a cast from and even with that fact all that factored in the cost savings is dramatic but so with CATI with all our solutions that we have to provide you know running the gamut from all our software side to our 3D printers from Stratasys to metal and our 3D scanners we can use all these things in conjunction to you know help everybody with really complex projects that might be hard to work on or traditional methods would be very expensive and we can modernize them get more accuracy from it and more reliability and faithfulness out of our designs so if there's something that maybe we can help you guys with that might be out of the ordinary or different you know feel free to reach out to us and see what else we might offer that can help make you guys lives easier more accurate